Welcome, everybody. This is the second week of our um, Learning Spaces Collaboratory Open Mic Conversations. Uh, the title of this conversation is Planning and Designing for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Um, I invite everybody to turn on your cameras if you're in a um, place that you can do so and you feel comfortable because this is a casual conversation, an open conversation, and we want you to speak up and chat with us today. Um, this issue's really been trending as student populations have diversified, but last summer with the pandemic as the backdrop, with the killings of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others, it really focused the spotlight for us on racial profiling and pre police brutality that have really pervaded society in the U.S. over the last decade or so. So in moving this conversation forward and ensuring um, that our campuses are welcoming environments to everyone and inclusive to all, we thought it would be really great to kind of just sit around the table and talk a little bit about what architects and planners and um, institutional partners can do to um, really create a space for belonging for students. So with that said, I am gonna quickly hand the baton over to Rich. He's gonna do a land acknowledgement for us and then I'll take the um, baton back and introduce, every, introduce the speakers on the call today. Great, hi, hi everyone and uh, welcome. I'm gonna share my screen real quickly, hopefully real quickly here. See if we can get this up. Uh, All right, everybody can see that, hopefully. Um, so uh, in the spirit and practice of inclusion, um, we wanted to, as uh, Shannon said, we wanted to open the session with a brief land acknowledgement. This is, only my second try at doing one of these. And so uh, those of you who are more experienced, uh, I really welcome your suggestions and, and feedback. Uh, I'm participating today from Monterra, California. It's a small town on the Pacific coast between Half Moon Bay and San Francisco. Um, we have a beautiful beach here in Monterra. You're seeing a, a photo of it. Uh, and now includes a small display about the history of the area that was recently added by the state and the California Coastal Commission. I've lived here for 24 years and been on the San Francisco Peninsula for 50 years. And I, I guess I always had the idea that the native people who preceded us had a pretty good thing going before the arrival of the Spanish in California. And I think that's generally true. They were a peaceful people. They have a, a great climate here, abundant salmon and crab and abalone and beautiful beaches near luscious redwood forests and lovely coastal mountains. And I knew they were generally the Ohlone Indians. And uh, of course I'd heard about the Spanish missions and the big land grants. But so diving just a little bit deeper and slightly more formally, I want to acknowledge that Monterra sits on the unceded ancestral homeland of the Ramaytush Ohlone peoples, who are the original inhabitants of the San Francisco Peninsula. There were about 10 tribes of the Ramaytush Ohlone all around the San Francisco Peninsula, and specifically right here in Monterra was a small village. It's still kind of a small village, but there was a small village of Chagunte of the Chiguan tribe, and they are thought to have had a stable population of about 40 or 50 at the time the Spanish arrived in uh, 1769. And strikingly to me, that was only 250 years ago. And finally, um, I'll just say, since we're going to be thinking about spaces and a sense of belonging, as Shannon just so nice, nicely put it, I'll mention that the uh, Ohlone peoples, like other indigenous tribes, like some other indigenous tribes at least, believed and believe, uh, uh, present tense, since many of them are still with us, that they belong to the land uh, rather than the land belonging to them. So let me uh, stop 
screen sharing and pass it back to you, Shannon. Okay, thank you. And for anyone that hasn't, I haven't had the pleasure of meeting that's on the call. My name is Shannon Dowling. I am an architect and analyst with AirSync Growth, and I help lead our trends around learning environments here in the office, um, serving higher education clients around the country, actually across the world. I am your formal moderator for the day, but um, the person that actually will make sure things happen and make sure your chats get to me if you choose to use the chat um, is David Reed. And I'll let you um, introduce yourself, David. Yeah, thank you, Shannon. Um, so my name is David Reed. I'm a principal with Gould Evans uh, Design and um, Planning Firm. Um, and um, my kind of interest in this conversation really has as much to do with my role in co-creating a, um, a toolkit around universal design for learning. And as you'll hear from Richard and Susan today, um, universal design for learning or UDL is really closely intertwined with diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. And uh, we were brought in by the folks kind of driving UDL forward. Um, based, you know, uh, closely tied to its origins at Harvard University to create a, a set of space design guidelines that can help support and augment um, some of the educational practices associated with UDL. So this is a subject near and dear to my heart, and I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great. And the two guests that we have today, I'm going to give you the quick elevator speech of each of them, and then I'm going to um, give them each the floor to actually go into their research a little bit. So we have Susan Whitmer on the phone. Um, Susan has her master's in accessibility and inclusive design. She spent her career at Herman Miller doing research across typologies of space. Um, her research is really grounded in the lived experience of students and the, pat and the patterns and the way that the students use it, the space to assist in their work. Um, and then with Susan, we also have Richard Holton, who spent over 30 years in education as both an administrator and an educator. Um, he was a key contributor to the update of the Learning Spaces rating system. And if you don't know what that is, um, I would he can tell you a little bit more, but it's great and you should um, really look at it. But um, the Learning Spaces rating system now has a lens towards inclusive um, physiological, cognitive, and cultural inclusion. So I will pass the floor over to Susan to start um, to tell us a little bit about your work. Thanks, Shannon. So I um, wanted to start by saying that I um, left Herman Miller about 18 months ago and established um, Susan Whitmer Studios. So a lot of the work that I have continued um, after my, uh, after I left Herman Miller continues to be um, centered around the lived experiences of the students um, at, throughout the lifelong learning process. So uh, when we started this, I, you know, we, we had several questions that we were thinking about. And I know that you've had a lot of materials um, sent to you lately. So I, I just want to be able to summarize a little bit of what we've talked about so far. And one of the first things that we discussed were what are the questions we should be asking in the planning to plan process. So that's what I'm going to talk about for just a few minutes. Um, and in order, I believe that in order to activate inclusion in the planning process, we have to start with a collective understanding of what inclusion means within the context of higher education, the campus, both physical and digital. So what is inclusion? Inclusion is one part of the broader equation of diversity, equity, and inclusion that leads to a sense of belonging and a sense of community. I think it's important to state what inclusive and equitable design is not. It is not an added feature and it is not simply a feel-good action. It is a disciplined approach to designing with intention. So I, I want to make sure that, that we all understand um, that it is a very important part, um, part of des the design practice. So where do you start? So like with any problem um, to be solved, you start with empathy. What are the lived experiences of our students? 
This goes beyond knowing their gender, their race, their nationality, or SAT scores. It's finding out how all of the experiences in their lives uh, intersect with the experiences that they're going to have on your campus. If you want to know what their needs are, ask them. Give them a real voice. Know your student. Know the lived experiences, not just as demographics on a spreadsheet. To do this, you have to understand that lived experiences are multidimensional and that we need to honor those multi-dimensions multi of our learners on the campus, throughout the campus experience. We need to step away from this notion that we are comparing learners against some false assumptions of the average learner because the average learner does not exist. You need to notice, you might have noticed recently that there's a lot of focus on workplace diversity um, especially over the past year, I've, I've see it everywhere. As part of this movement toward diversity, many major corporations are now intentionally recruiting employees who are neurodiverse. The truth is approximately 15 to 20% of our population is neurodivergent. So what does that mean? Neurodiversity refers to a range, the range of differences in the individual brain function and behavioral traits regarded as part of just the normal variation of human, the human population. It includes the autism spectrum disorder, ADD, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, um, and Tourette syndrome and others. What hasn't been stated often enough is neurodiverse thinkers often possess exceptional talents when it comes to things like innovation, creative storytelling, empathy, design thinking, um, pattern recognition, coding, and problem solving. So you can understand why they're becoming a very valuable asset to the workplace. We also need to understand the lived experiences of our learners that may include students who are veterans, who maybe have challenges with PTSD. It could be students who are challenged with food or housing insecurities, physical limitations, learners who may identify as LGBTQ+, our international students, and other multidimensional lived experiences. I believe it's our responsibility to plan campuses in a way that reduces the cognitive and mental stress facing this diverse community of students and where students can see themselves represented in the physical artifacts and attributes of the spaces on campus. So to borrow from Dr. Terrell Strayhorn from Virginia Un Union University, this means creating spaces where everyone belongs and the spaces belong to them. At the strategic level, it means it applies to the entire campus community and all of the spaces on campus. So now I'm going to ask you to en engage with me in a quick little exercise. This comes from a scenario from Tisha Fitzgerald's book, Anti-Racism and Universal Design for Learning, Building Expressways to Success. So if you will, just close your eyes for a moment. Imagine you're walking down a dark alley. You feel like it might be dangerous, but you also feel like you have no alternatives to get to where you're going. There is not much light, just a flickering bulb from a street light that's casting shadows as you walk through the alley. You get to the end of the alley and hear footsteps behind you. You begin to jog to your car, but the footsteps pick up the same pace. You hear hurried breathing behind you and turn around to see someone barreling toward you. You're not sure if it's life or death, a life or death situation, but your muscles tense and the adrenaline begins to soar. What do you do? you can open your eyes. 
So think about that experience. What did you feel? I can tell you that when I first read this passage, my heart was racing. I felt the stress of uncertainty and terror, not knowing what was going to happen, feeling trapped in the circumstance, powerless against my situation. Now let's switch from the dark alley to the classroom. So you're sitting there and there may be windows, there may not. There's bright lights that flicker. There are walls that are bare with only big boards covered in equations that you don't understand. And there's this constant humming noise in the background. You look around the room and no one, knows, you, no one looks like you. Suddenly the professor calls your name. You freeze. The silence is terrifying. This time the professor loudly calls your name, suggesting you pay attention. How much content do you think you would retain after the example in the alley or the, the, the example in the classroom? How willing are you going to be to answer a question or participate in a group activity? Research shows us that something happens to the brain when there's fear present. It interferes with our critical thinking and problem solving skills. Students cannot take academic risk in a classroom where they do not feel safe. What was interesting about this scenario, the alley scenario, is that while it was written through the lens of anti-racism, the person in the alley could have been a neurodiverse student, could have been a veteran with PTSD, an LGBTQ plus student, or even an older adult who's returned to class. It could also be a student struggling with housing or food insecurities, which requires them to work two jobs just to survive. We have to understand what fear looks like in the lived experiences of our students. This is where inclusion and equity starts. Um, I, I want to end with just a few insights that I think um, paints a picture of the impact that good design can have. Um, so what is inclusive and equitable campus design? Why, why is it important? It means that the places and spaces and experiences on campuses were designed based on foundations of healthy buildings and with intention to honor every student's unique lived experiences. Students who feel their uniqueness is honored are more likely to feel safe and develop a sense of community and a sense of belonging, increasing attraction, retention, and persistence to graduation. And I think we can all agree that's important. Inclusive and equitable design practices have a direct relationship to physical, emotional, and mental well being, which promotes health equity. Research tells us that designing healthy indoor spaces drives performance and productivity. An inclusive and equitable student experience could reduce the number of accommodations that are directed to the Office of Disability Services. An inclusive and equitable campus builds a culture of resilience to respond to disruptive local, regional, and global challenges, think pandemic. And lastly, it basically comes down to making learning human, graduating workplace ready adults, and establishing economically sound practices. So that sort of summarizes, I think, um, at least from my point of view, the value that inclusive and equitable design bring to the campus. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Shannon, but I have a couple of references that I'll put in the chat um, in case you guys are interested. 
Wow, Susan, I really appreciated um, that exercise. It was really great. And it reminds me a lot of um, the surveys I've been doing and just hearing students and faculty alike say that they like to sit on the same level as someone and look them in the eye and that they feel uncomfortable when they know there are people um, behind their back and they can't actually turn around and look at them. So it was really nice. I will turn it over to Richard now to talk a little bit about his um, research. Thanks. And Susan, it's always so great to hear how, uh, how you pull so many pieces together uh, around uh, inclusion and, and DEI. I'm going to share my screen again, hopefully. And there we go. Um, I'm going to try to complement um, Susan's insights by sharing the approach to inclusion that we developed for version three of the learning space rating system, which uh, we recently released with um, Educause. For those uh, who aren't familiar with the LSRS, it's a tool for measuring the design of learning spaces, specifically classrooms, it's, uh, in the degree to which they can facilitate multiple modalities of learning and teaching. Uh, it's a rating system with a series of credits like the LEAD system or the well building standards. But where um, LEAD and well measure features of the built environment that impact health, well being, uh, or sustainability, uh, LSRS measures features of the built environment that impact learning. You can see on this slide that the LSRS has seven sections in two major parts with part A focused on kind of the global issues, the campus context, operations, planning, and so on. And part B is uh, asserts metrics for, you know, the stuff that actually goes in to spaces. Uh, and so for version three, we've added a, a dedicated section on inclusion as Shan Shannon mentioned at the beginning. Um, and you can see uh, over on the right that has three credits for inclusion, physical inclusion, cognitive inclusion, and cultural inclusion. And I'll say just a few words about each of these. But first, I want to make um, a few overall points that I think are really important. Uh, number one, um, although we have this dedicated section on inclusion, we think that notions of inclusion permeate throughout version three. And if anyone has some, um, any of you've read the tool, the tool instrument or used it, uh, you'll see that we have a lot of uh, cross references and related credits uh, throughout. For just one example, in um, section two, planning and design, we talk about the importance of creating diverse, inclusive design teams. Um, and uh, uh, especially good example is uh, credit 7.2 there on the right, cog what we've called cognitive inclusion, where most of the means by which you would design and equip a classroom to support multiple means of representation and engagement, as this credit asks for and so on, uh, the ways of doing that are, would be found in typically in section, in our section five, layout and furnishings, and section six, technology and tools. Uh, second point, overall point, and I think this is the most important, is that the main way and by far the most significant way in which an inclusive learning environment is created is through teaching practice, through pedagogy. Uh, teachers who are trained and skilled at inclusive teaching practices, and, and that's not what we're addressing here, although th the work is informed by those practices, uh, those teachers can implement those practices in practically any space, physical, uh, physical spaces or, or online spaces. Um, and conversely, you could have a room that is, you know, super duper designed room, maybe scores a thousand percent on the uh, LSRS measures. And of course, that's no guarantee that any kind of inclusive teaching is going to take, is going to take place there. So the LSRS measures the potential performance of the design of a space, not what actually happens in a space, similar to how LEAD 
the lead system can get people to design, you know, environment friendly systems, but then the users of the building, you know, leave the doors open and the air conditioner runs all the time. Um, so our goal with inclusion in the LSRS is to articulate some things that in the built environment that can, first of all, uh, do no harm to inclusion efforts uh, because harm has definitely been done in the past. Uh, and second, to support, facilitate, enhance those um, inclusive teaching practices. So third overall point is just that, um, well, first we intend this framework as a research-based starting point, not some kind of, you know, answer, final answer. Um, and these three uh, legs of the stool or aspects of inclusion are certainly not mutually exclusive. We don't intend them that way. Think that they um, overlap and complement each other. And so really we think of them as different perspectives or lenses on inclusion. So a few words about each of these lenses. Uh, first, physical inclusion and universal design. And I'm gonna read you the intent statement. All of the credits in the LSRS began with an intent statement. I think that's similar to uh, LEAD also. Uh, the intent is to welcome learners with different physical abilities by providing not only access to the space and its affordances, but also the opportunity to participate fully in the learning experience. And so our goal here is to get people thinking especially about the latter, that's participating fully or equitably in the learning experience. So going beyond ADA requirements to, for example, provide you know, wheelchair spaces that sit in the back of the room or that sit along one side and so are literally marginalized in the, in the space. So rather equitable access for uh, everyone to participate. Um, secondly, what we've called cognitive inclusion is really about uh, what uh, David started, started talking about and, and, is, and emphasized in his work. And that is trying to apply UDL, universal design for learning, um, which again is a pedagogical approach, a set of teaching practices not a set of classroom design guidelines, but we're trying to apply that to the built environment. How does it apply? Um, and UDL, as David may say more about, you wanna offer students multiple ways of receiving, engaging with, and expressing information and content. And providing um, multiple modalities for learning and teaching is actually the main thrust of the entire LSRS. So again, uh, inclusion is at the heart of the tool, and you could say that UDL is at the um, is at the heart of um, the LSRS too. And finally, um, cultural inclusion. I think this is certainly the most difficult to specify and to quantify. Uh, and I can tell you that the LSRS teams. I've been on all the teams from going back to version one. Uh, the last couple of versions we have wrestled with this for years. Um, how can the physical environment help create a sense of belonging? How do you make spaces welcoming and inviting? Well, we've thought about cultural inclusion mainly in the sense of social identities as they're discussed in social psychology research. And that suggests, that research suggests that markers of social identity in the environment so-called ambient cues uh, can impact student performance and learning and certainly their sense of belonging. So a fundamental dilemma, I think, in this area of cultural inclusion, and we don't have any answer for it, but pose this question, I guess, to the community, uh, is the trade-off between uh, removing markers of social identity and adding markers of social identity. We know that historically some spaces have been designed in a context of excluding certain groups, uh, in large groups like women or ethnic minorities. And a general trend of modernist architecture has been to remove cultural markers from spaces and make spaces uh, neutral or culture free. Um, 
and you know, I don't think there's such a thing as a neutral space. But uh, on the other hand, adding elements like visual elements, verbal elements, symbolic elements that are associated with particular uh, uh, users of spaces seems to have a welcoming or inviting effect. Um, so uh, I'll conclude uh, by just showing a few images of spaces as examples of ways that these aspects of inclusion might be approached. And, Richard, and uh, while, while you're doing that, um, mm -hmm. you might have an example in here uh, to answer a question in the chat, uh, an example of a marker of social identity. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, what that is. okay. <laughs> right. So, well, let's see, actually, uh, let me, if I can go down here, uh, I'll show, let me show uh, a, a, an example in just one, in one second. First, a quick example uh, from a Penn State of a space where uh, one way to, um, uh, to, um, uh, you have physical inclusion of the type we're talking about is it, and allow people of all different abilities is to have desks that are, you know, uh, are all adjustable. So, you know, a person in a wheelchair can sit anywhere in this room. And it's also, I think, an example with um, some of the uh, technology affordances in here. It's an example of uh, cognitive inclusion uh, because of all the different um, uh, modalities that are offered or provided uh, for um, uh, content delivery and content offering and so on. Uh, let me see if I can get, okay. So he here's here's a otherwise generic space. And the photo here is from Joan Lippincott, who's on the call today. Hello, Joan. Um, thanks for providing, for sharing this photo. Um, and so this is a pretty generic space with a, what we could call a marker of uh, social identity, a very uh, uh, explicit marker of social identity. Um, and here is a space that might be the opposite of modernist architecture, the a longhouse space from a UBC, from, you know, inspired by indigenous uh, architecture, where the entire space is kind of a, uh, 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 markers of social identities of those uh, indigenous peoples, if that makes sense. Um, here's um, some uh, 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 stories, some narratives, you know, integrated into, onto the wall with uh, literally with stories from first generation students, um, as you can see in a library space. I would love to know what's working well at your campus right now or um, what sorts of conversations you're having around space and physical space, planning, planning space and belonging and or what types of conversations are you having with your client? It would just be good to understand where everybody is in, along this journey. And, and while those questions are coming in, let me go back to the uh, markers of social identity question, which I dodged while I was um, showing images. But um, I, I mean, I think the, a, a, a very basic example is is uh, the classic, um, I don't know, uh, a black faculty member comes to join the faculty at an institution and pictures lining the, the faculty uh, department area are all, you know, of white males. Um, and, you know, that, uh, that person may wonder if he belongs there. Those are markers of social identity because they're there. And, and if you uh, change up how you present, there's, uh, in the research, there's examples of, uh, of, of uh, you know, having just images of women, changing language and description of computer science courses, uh, uh, things like that. All of those are, uh, you know, have cultural identity markers in them, the language, the photos, um, and so on. 
Any ideas how to address pathways in between buildings in a more deliberate fashion? Susan, do you have any thoughts about that? Well, in my paper, I talk about this in terms of legibility and how important that is. And it is um, it, using architectural features sort of as to build intuitive wayfinding. Um, there are lots of good ways to do that. Um, just making sure that, because the whole point to me is that you, every, we want people to be able to um, sort of get their bearings, right? Anywhere they are on campus, because it's, if, if you have that unsettled feeling that you can't, can't quite get your bearings, then you're, you're more than likely going to want to leave that space. So, um, it's, it's really thinking about what are the architectural features that can do that. Um, just making sure that, because uh, our students spend so much time walking back and forth on campus, making sure that they're, um, even some of the identity markers are along the pathways, right? And you can do that in a very natural way. Um, it could be a bench or something that reflects some a particular culture or, um, just just anything that can be done. And, and it varies campus to campus. There's no one solution for that. But um, to me, legibility is about being able to get a balance between order and chaos and um, making sure that there are um, as much as possible creating intuitive wayfinding features to help do that. Yeah, that, that's also a big part of the work we um, have studied with the UDL work, Susan, and um, you know, the lens we like to test with campus wayfinding is the, the first generation mm -hmm. student, particularly at a community college level, that might have English as a second language. And if we can make campus easily navigated for them, uh, we're probably going to make it easily navigated for a lot of other users. And then there's always the idea of interactive maps um, like you were suggesting and and you know we talk about applying the five e's of user experience you know the entice enter uh, engage exit and extend and if you really think about the continuum of user experience uh, making sure your your first year and first generation students don't get frustrated and discouraged and leave you know, it's a huge benefit to the institution uh, as far as retention goes. I found another interesting conversation around um, exterior environments. Um, this this year that's been brought up in terms of inclusion is about um, how traditionally a lot of campuses were set up with the big lawn or the big green space, but that when students want to express themselves, when we saw them come out and um, out last summer and really demand change, those weren't the spaces that they occupied. The spaces that they occupied were the more hardscape plaza spaces and just the idea of having places for protest on your campus versus um, places that are just really Really about like formality and gathering. I, th I thought that was a nice addition to hear. I think Rich was asking me a question. Oh, go ahead, Jim. So I wanted to just relate uh, some research that we did back in 2015 uh, with my um, co-principal investigator as the Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning at Morgan State University, which is a historically black uh, university. And she is a small, petite uh, Filipino woman. Uh, and she spent a lot of her time talking to students about um, the grades, the, the, the grades they got that were unsatisfactory to them because their professor was of a different race. So in our research, we, we really extended the sort of uh, active learning research. We called it back in 2015. <laughs> um, uh, what we found was that uh, uh, the professor in that study was African-American and, and most of the students were very uh, multi-ethnic, but uh, about half African-American. He found that in the traditional classroom, the students still raised their hand and asked him a question, but that in the active learning class, the students never really asked him a question. 
they took responsibility and ownership of their own knowledge. And they didn't have any complaints in the active learning classroom about uh, an authoritarian type of uh, professor because there was nowhere for him to, there was no lectern for him to stand behind. If he wanted to engage students, he had to go sit at their table and look at them in the same plane, eye to eye. So when students learn together and don't hold the professor responsible for their knowledge, they take more, more ownership of that themselves. Um, it seemed to work for a diverse ethnic group much better. And I think, Evie, you had your hand raised too, didn't you? Yeah, hi. Um, I think picking up on a little bit of what David was saying and also Susan's comment about really trying to pay attention to the lived experiences of the students and um, then what some of the things that came up just during COVID, particularly in the college that I'm studying, um, which is kind of has the profile of a community college, which is just the, the, ex the tremendous burden of students who are heads of household <laughs> um, and that many of them just didn't stay enrolled. Um, and so like what, <laughs> and that, you know, so, okay, so you take that, you can read about it in the newspaper, but then what does that mean? And I think this is the question that these campuses are asking is like, what does that mean for our campus, <laughs> right? Like, and, and, and Shannon and I have talked about this too, like there are more food pantries, there are more like academies to just retain and reach out and provide housing assistance. Um, so how does that look? So the question I think where the topic and what you guys are starting, I think to really open and just be open to uh, here in this group is like, what is that lived experience and what, how can that embrace of getting the support to go to housing court, getting not just food once a week, you might need to go to the food pantry more than once a week. You might not need just food, you need the computer, you need the Wi-Fi. Um, I don't think people knew two years ago how much we needed Wi-Fi to learn <laughs> at home, <laughs> right? I remember in some of these conversations, just hearing about like, well, the library, you know, you go to the library to use your computer for distance learning. Well, this year going to the library wasn't, you know, so available. So, so I don't know, I think it's like, you know, so what does that mean for us? I think it's the question when you really listen to the lived experience. I think Susan, you just said it really, really well. Like, how can we hear that in a way that doesn't necessarily just mean, um, things about the pathway or the outdoor space, which are really important, <laughs> but it might go past that. And how do we break through that? <laughs> um, yeah, that's what I'm hearing. <laughs> that's a good point. I, I can tell you, I was at a conference, gosh, a couple of years ago, and someone was actually talking about um, food insecurities and housing insecurities on their campus. And I was shocked. I knew about it because I had been researching it, but I was really shocked is a good word at how many people came up to me and said they didn't realize that was even happening on their campus. I, you know, and I understand it. You know. I also think students who have housing insecurity don't even know that what they're experiencing is housing insecurity. They're like, oh, I'm just couch surfing or I'm just staying with friends for a bit. They're like, <laughs> like they're also not even putting themselves in that category. Yeah. Right? They don't even recognize it until you sort of accept they're allowed to sort of say, well, this might be impacting. Mm -hmm. You're thinking about your progress academically when you actually didn't have a place to live. Yeah. They, they don't even think that that's them. Yeah. I, in, in my paper, I talk about um, permeable spaces and um, I use the example of the um, Salazar Wellness Center at the University of Denver, University of Colorado, Denver. And on the fourth floor of this building, it's a, it's only a probably four years old now, four or five years old, just a beautiful space. And on the fourth floor of this building is 
a, a space that is, is directed to um, meeting the needs of the students. There's a food pantry there. There's a nap room for students who either are commuters or they're living in their car in the garage um, and doing the best they can to stay enrolled in school. Um, there's lots of counseling. So that's, that's two things to me. One, one example of a permeable space where, it, where those experiences, it's a pass through, right? But um, they intentionally design that space to meet the needs of those students. And um, secondly, it is an example of better use of campus real estate. Um, if, you, if you really are committed to wellness, it was a great example of that's what wellness is about. That's one part of it, so. I might direct our um, attention back. Susan, there's a question further up in the chat from Marie. Um, so in your article about permeability being important to inclusivity, um, question is how is permeability different from legibility? So legibility to me is being able to navigate um, and, and get in a space or get your bearings in the space. Permeability, the way I, um, from my research, look at it is being able to continue your knowledge building, your coursework, um, engaging in experiences that enhance that, whether you're leaving the classroom and going into a different building, right? All over campus, that is a continuation. So um, it, to me, it breaks down a bit of the silo effect um, if you're focusing on making your campus permeable. And I thought about this, Maria, a couple of days ago. Um, I've talked a lot, almost every time we get together, I talk about the Florida State Innovation Hub um, because I love that space. And another reason I think it is so great is that they, and this is, they just got started and then we had pandemic. So I'm, I'm sure they're trying to get back to these, these opportunities. They are actually using, um, in the Innovation Hub, they are bringing the local community leaders together. So whether it's someone who at the state level or local level involved in um, homelessness, right? Uh, um, or different types of, of needs that they have. And the, the um, schools are bringing them in, the departments are bringing in their students who have interest in this. And that's taking, like if you're in the social sciences, it's permeable to me because you are taking that, you know, everything you're learning in your academic building and you are able to engage in activities that are enhancing what you're learning in your coursework or really elevating um, that experience. So to me, that's a bit of what permeability is about um, from, from my um, perspective. And, there's, there's, so, go ahead. And you're, you're bringing that, that's what inclusion is, right? You're bringing all those diverse um, students together and giving, empowering them with their voice and their contributions to their local community. So. I was just gonna add the structural aspects of how you architect the campus to that lovely notion of permeability. Uh, uh, where do you build faculty offices? You know, and, and you know, a lot of campuses, faculty offices are built separate from the teaching, you know, in a separate, you know, structure, separate space from, from uh, teaching uh, facilities, which was, what does that say that, you know, that, you know, you, you wanna try to separate students and faculty instead of put them on the same, those same permeable paths. Right, right. So there's a couple um, 
questions or comments in the chat about classroom spaces and how it would be really nice to have some photos. I wanted to make sure everybody on this call knows about Flexspace. And I uh, Flexspace is a uh, offshoot of Educause. And um, I think you only need an email address to log on. And then you can actually, different universities around the country will post their photos on Flexspace and you can search it by classroom type or, you know, I want a digital media lab, or I want a gaming space. Um, and they have some really good examples on there that I actually use to show clients a lot. Um, but I know, like, for instance, there's a photo on there from Fresno State, I think, that shows square tables that are up higher and round tables that are down lower. And then there's another one, I think it's from Case Western, but I'm not positive where it has both um, linear tables and some soft seating in a classroom. So you can really get um, a good idea of what your peers are doing and what other people out there are doing and what's working and what's not. And what I like about it is actually each one also has like some serial box stats um, about how many people are in the room, what type of technology is in the room, how many uh, assignable square feet, feet is in the room. So if you don't know about that, I would definitely go look there. And Shannon, and Shannon have a link uh, for that? The learning space rating system and flex space have a new integration now with uh, version three. So you can um, uh, use flex space as a, a way to um, upload your scores. If you use the learning space rating system and you can also search for other uh, classrooms that have been rated and look at how did they, how did they do on uh, cultural inclusion, for yeah. example. Yeah, I um, serve as an advisor to Flexspace in, in, in the research area, and we're trying to work with um, our constituents and, and make sure that um, we can start having these conversations about DEI and how can we make sure those are reflected in the spaces that we're doing. So that's, that's ongoing work, um, but there's some great examples out there already. And it's about choice, right? Giving people, giving students choice of how they sit, where they sit, um, being able to ease into group work um, because not all students are going to, you know, I remember when we first doing started doing active learning, it was like, okay, the faculty member will give some information to you and now everybody get up and we're gonna change and, get into group um, project work. Well, if you're a new neurodivergent student or a veteran with PTSD, there's a, a million different um, um, dimensions to it. That may not be the easiest thing for you to do. So giving the choice and how you, um, how you participate in the class and how you move through the space is very helpful. And there's good examples. Of there's, there's, yeah, there's a couple current questions in the chat that I think relate to one another. One's from Marie about whether we recommend not depicting people in architectural space as it seems very difficult to accurately represent diversity of social identities. And then Joan um, kind of asks or comments similarly about hearing thoughts about whether we can design spaces where all students feel welcome and included. And, and Susan, as you talked about students with PTSD, um, it just brings up a, a segment where if you put them in a group setting and, and expect them to do teamwork, you're putting them into a social emotional minefield. And so the spaces Richard was showing might help some students feel more included. And it might put that, that fear that you are depicting in your early exercise in other students. So I think it's really hard and I would almost conjecture yeah. to say, no, we're not, never gonna design spaces that, that can accommodate everyone unless students have the autonomy and ability and working with a, an instructor to, to reconfigure a classroom to, to support mm -hmm. the specific needs that might come with each uh, cohort of students. But I'd like others to maybe weigh in on that. You can create a backlash effect when you try to force um, those markers of social identity into spaces uh, too. And there's some research on that as well. But I, I mean, I think one approach is, is, uh, is to uh, look at your community, look at 
at, at your um, cohorts of students and have them involved in the uh, and and have them participating in the design and have their with they, their representations in the space. So like UBC and you know a lot of institutions in Canada have you know have a, a large indigenous um, uh, influences, and so that is reflected in their spaces, and that makes a lot a big segment of the population feel you know, feel welcome there. And uh, hopefully it doesn't, you know, turn off other <laughs> segments of the population. So, I mean, I think you can get close. We can, you can certainly get closer than we have been by at least being conscious of, of these things. Yeah, and there was a great session at SCUP in Seattle a couple of years ago um, by a group of students from Portland Community College. And what really struck me is that they felt quite uncomfortable uh, in some of the spaces that we as architects thought were quite inclusive and nice because they looked like white people's space. They looked like affluent space. They looked like fancy space. And they did not look like the spaces that this particular student group and some of the students on those campuses felt at home in. So it's, it's very contextually relevant uh, as well. Yeah, my favorite example of that is the social stair and how every, you know, architect from 2015 to now has been designing social stairs into their uh, academic buildings. But if you actually look at who utilizes the social stair, it's your traditional white 18 to 22 year old student and everybody else kind of avoids them. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, I, I find myself thinking about safe space as, as we're, we're thinking about this and just what that means and how hard a thing it is to get to. And, you know, we think about these processes of and inclusive processes where, you know, you're really kind of in this process of engagement to find out what that is and incorporate it into the design. But I think that it's not linear. And I think you know what I mean, this combination. And when you get to diversity, the idea of safe space becomes diverse. And so it's just a very kind of, I think, fluid um, kind of connection. So it, it's interesting to think about. Well, yeah. When some bathrooms were um, changed to be um, uh, gender neutral, that, that was some research found that other groups, uh, other um, historically marginalized groups also felt safer, not just, you know, uh, transgender or gender uh, uh, diverse students, but other groups as well. So there is evidence that that safety um, can um, kind of spread out from interventions like that. I think it's an interesting point, though, that um safe spaces are different things for different people. So, you know, open, super transparent, super visible, make a lot of people feel safe, but not necessarily the, the veteran students. It has been a, a healthy conversation and uh, really appreciate everybody's input.